Welcome. My name is Carol Hills, and I'm your moderator today. Uh, we're here to talk. I, I'm, I'm actually the a senior producer and reporter for PRI's The World, and I'm today's moderator. Um, we're here to talk about dietary supplements, uh, what they are, whether they're effective, and whether they're safe. I want to introduce our panelists. To my immediate right is Chuck Bell. He's um, Programs Director for Consumers Union, which is the policy and mobilization arm for Consumer Reports. Joanne Mason is chief Manson. of the Manson, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Joanne Manson is chief of the Division of Preventive Medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital and study director of the vitamin D and omega-3 trial. Um, Bryn Austin is professor in the, in the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences at the Harvard Chan School, right here. And she's director of STRIPED, uh, which is the Strategic Training Initiative for the Prevention of Eating Disorders. And finally, Peter Cohen, he's a general internist at Cambridge Health Alliance, and he's also an assistant professor of medicine at the Harvard Medical School. And this event is presented jointly with PRI's The World and WGBH. Um, our program is also part of the Dr. Lawrence H. and Roberta Cohn forums. Uh, very sadly, Dr. Cohn passed away last year, and everyone at the forum misses him terribly. I want to remind everybody that we're streaming live on the websites of the forum and on PRI's The World, and we're also streaming on Facebook. And we will have a brief Q&A toward the end of the program, and I encourage you to email your questions to the forum at hsph.harvard the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. And you can also participate uh, in a chat that's happening on the forum site right now. Um, we want to start this by talking about uh, just how he enormous the supplements industry is. It's multi-billion dollars, and we want to get a, a sense of that by looking at a clip from a Frontline episode called Supplements and Safety. If you could play the clip. It's estimated there are 85,000 dietary supplements for sale in the United States today. Right here I have our liposomal D. Uh, so this D is our bacopa. This is an herb that would be great for older contains individuals that are The essential nutrients like chromium. With so many pitches and promises, you might assume that some government agency has approved them before allowing them onto the market. The FDA does not do any review of dietary supplements before they come onto the market. And I think that all consumers need to understand this. No testing, no obligation to provide any evidence a product is effective or even safe. The one thing manufacturers do have to show is that they follow good manufacturing practices. The FDA conducts inspections for that, but it's limited by resources and by information. I'm going to turn to Chuck Bell uh, to start our discussion and with a simple question, um, if you could briefly explain what is a dietary supplement? Sure. Um, so as the name implies, a dietary supplement is a, is a product that's intended to supplement the diet. And these are products that are taken by mouth, uh, such as pills, powders, drinks, energy bars, and they contain dietary ingredients uh, such as vitamins, minerals, amino acids, which are building blocks for proteins, and herbs and botanicals, as well as other substances that are dietary ingredients. Uh, now, as mentioned in the clip, unlike prescription drugs, dietary s supplements are not subject to pre-market safety testing or safety review by the FDA, and yet they appear in pharmacies and supermarkets in the same stream of commerce as over-the-counter drugs that do have a safety review process. So consumers are understandably confused, and we did a poll at Consumer Reports in 2015 that found a majority of people do think that they are vetted for safety by the FDA. So very important for consumers to understand that. Uh, dietary supplements are governed by a separate section of the federal law called the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act, or DSHEA, uh, which was passed in 1994 after a blitz of industry lobbying. And we've grown, as the clip implies, from a, a smaller marketplace in 2004, where, uh, in 1994, where there was around 4,000 products uh, to as many as 90,000 products a day, with over 1,000 new supplement products coming on the marketplace every year. And so a uh, concern that we have at Consumer Reports is that these products are presumed to be similar for foods, and so they're presumed to be safe, but they often contain ingredients which are highly 
uh, concentrated, which are sort of unconventionally strong from a dietary perspective. Uh, and they also have products that are poorly understood by science. There's many things we don't know about herbs and botanicals uh, that may be toxic or have a variety of unexpected effects. So there's a lot of reason for the consumer to be skeptical and to, to be very wary about these products and definitely to discuss them with their uh, health providers before they use them. And just one other aspect too is that while dietary supplements are not allowed to make uh, claims about being miracle cures to cure a, a disease or a condition or to prevent dementia, they are allowed to make what are called structure function claims uh, such as it helps build strong bones, helps improve cognitive function, helps improve prostate function. And so consumers can be understandably uh, forgiven for being a little confused about the types of claims that are made and oftentimes there's very little evidence behind the claims that are being made. Joanne Manson, you've studied the effectiveness of vitamins and minerals. Uh, do we know if they even work? Well, this is a really key problem that even for some of the vitamins and minerals, which would be the most favorably received, the, the um, supplements that have the best reputations out there, there's very little evidence of either safety or efficacy, especially long-term safety and efficacy. And the randomized trials that have been done have even identified risks. Um, some risks have been identified with the high dose uh, beta carotene supplements, uh, increased risk of lung cancer um, in smokers, um, with high dose vitamin E, uh, an increased risk of heart failure, um, all cause mortality, prostate cancer. There have been quite a few risks um, associated with very high doses of these supplements. Overall, there are about 50% um, of the population, according to national surveys, taking at least one of these dietary supplements and fully one third take multivitamins. It may, it may be surprising to many of you that uh, the multivitamins themselves have not been well tested in randomized trials. Only really one large scale randomized trial done in men. Uh, the US Physicians Health Study, we're now doing a trial called COSMOS, which is testing multivitamins in uh, women as well as trying to replicate the findings in men that there was a slight reduction, about an 8% reduction in the risk of cancer with multivitamins. But overall, very little uh, research, very little in terms of uh, large-scale randomized trials with long-term use of these supplements. And they certainly are not a substitute or replacement for um, a healthy diet. Very few people have been identified to actually need these supplements if you have a healthy diet. Uh, there's very little um, evidence of benefit except for sub subgroups within the populations, which are women at childbearing age are encouraged to have folic acid. Uh, people who have um, bone health problems encouraged to have calcium, vitamin D. And then if you're taking certain medications that can interfere with absorption, of micronutrients, perhaps taking uh, supplements. If, if, for example, you take a proton pump inhibitor or have um, fat malabsorption uh, syndrome, but it's subgroups of the population where there's evidence of uh, benefit from taking these dietary supplements. Bryn Austin, I know the Food and Drug Administration is concerned about three categories of these dietary supplements. What are they? Yeah, at least three. The, certainly the top ones are the weight loss supplements, the muscle building or sports performance supplements, and then the sexual function ones, which are more often targeting men, but certainly people of all genders are using these products. What we're concerned about in these, these categories in particular is a problem with adulteration, uh, where, where manufacturers are deliberately including ingredients that are illegal to be there. They may be prescription pharmaceuticals, they may be anabolic steroids, and there may be other kinds of uh, high concentration. Um, as Chuck mentioned, very high concentrations of green tea extract is often in weight loss supplements. And we know that these, are, these can be very toxic. They can have drug interactions with other products. And the FDA has pulled out these three categories, weight loss, muscle building, or sports performance, and sexual function as, as basically the most lawless of all the categories of supplements where the, where the most problems are turning up. Just a couple of years ago, the Centers for Disease Control did a, a study of emergency rooms of um, finding that more than 23,000 Americans are being sent to emergency rooms every year because of problems with dietary supplements. 
And of that 23,000, fully 25% were attributed to weight loss dietary supplements, the ones uh, marketed, sold for that in particular. Now, the weight loss supplements don't make up 25% of the entire industry, but they are making up a very large minority of the cases where people are being sent to the emergency room. And then thousands, in addition to just showing up at the emergency room, uh, thousands of those are turning into people needing to be hospitalized because of injury. And as you mentioned, uh, I direct a program, Stripe, that's focused on prevention of eating disorders. We're particularly worried about the kinds of um, categories of products that exploit body image problems, that exploit uh, people with eating disorders or body dysmorphia. People are more likely to be vulnerable to the kind of deceptive marketing of promises of building big muscles or losing weight fast. Um, because these are the, the people who are most likely to use them, although they're used very widely. Among people who are trying to lose weight, about 45% of women and 20% of men say they've used weight loss dietary supplements. Meanwhile, these products don't work, they're not medically recommended, and they can be harmful. Peter, we've been hearing about the risks associated with supplements. Can you give us the big picture um, of, in terms of adverse effects related to supplements? And more specifically, uh, what are the <coughs> concerns about supplements for sports and for sexual function? Sure. So what's interesting is that, um, as um, Chuck has described, supplements are sold under the broad category of food. And they're actually, if you compare the safety of ingredients that can be added to food compared to ingredients that can be added to supplements, it's, it's very interesting because the bar is even lower to introduce something to a supplement. So let's say you want to spray some preservative into a can of um, tomato soup that you're selling. That preservative that you're putting into the tomato soup has to meet a certain standard called GRASS that's generally, generally recognized as safe. And that's uh, basically a group of scientific experts have to agree that that product is safe at that dose. Um, that does not, grass is not the standard for new ingredients to be introduced to supplements. It's a lower standard that does not require anything at that level of scrutiny that scienti scientists need to sit down together and decide this is safe for human consumption. So what we have are products that are being sold to improve your health, to maintain health or, or, or improve it. And there's app, the bar is exceedingly low, even to introduce brand new ingredients into these supplements. Um, so it's not surprising that although from the, shape, from the regulatory perspective, they're all presumed to be safe, and the FDA's job is to track down the dangerous supplements. But the reality is that many people, like Bryn was describing, are harmed from supplements. And um, that estimate that the CDC had of about 23,000 people every year ending up in emergency rooms is probably um, a large underestimation of the dangers of supplements. And, and the reason is that in that study, it was based on sentinel emergency rooms, 63 emergency rooms throughout the United States that the CDC was tracking. And they had no special training of the providers in the emergency room to detect or to even ask about supplements or to detect supplement harm. So what they did is they just reviewed the records, the charts of patients who came to the hospital and they found that an estimated national estimate of 23,000 people ended up in the emergency room due to adverse effects of supplements that just happened to be noted by the physicians with no particular training. So that's a very low estimate of probably how much harm is going on. So uh, what's interesting here is this parallel between what the, um, what the law uh, requires about safety and expects about safety and the reality. And we have a real uh, disconnect between those, uh, those two. And again, uh, we, what uh, my team of the analytical chemists that I work with and I, we study particularly, is that in these products that Brennan's mentioned, those categories like weight loss and sports supplements, what we're finding is that many of the products contain novel pharmaceutical-like substances. So it might contain not amphetamine, because amphetamine obviously is a controlled substance, not legally sold, but it might contain amphetamine when the methyl group or a few carbons are moved slightly on the molecule to something that would appear at first to fly under the regu regulatory radar screen, even though we, in many cases, have early data, sometimes even human data, that that 
version of amphetamine or that version of methamphetamine, which we've also found in supplements, uh, has pharmacological effects. So th those are some of the issues that we're particularly interested in. We've laid out the issues here, or some of the issues with supplements. We're going to turn to a more kind of interactive discussion, trying to look at ways to uh, minimize, um, to, uh, to decrease the, the harm done or decrease the concerns about them. And we're going to take a look at another clip from the Frontline episode, Supplements and Safety. And it's interesting because uh, this clip is about what the Children's Hospital Philadelphia has been doing to uh, try to protect patients who enter the hospital with supplements that they're going to take during their stay and the hospital's concerned about the safety of the supplements and the hospital's responsible for their care. So this is the dilemma that the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia is wrestling with. In 2013, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia had had enough. Worried about the number and quality of the supplements their patients were arriving with, hospital pharmacists decided to challenge manufacturers. Families are showing up literally with shopping bags full of dietary supplements. Regulatory issues in the United States are that you have to, if a patient brings a medication into a hospital, we have to, as pharmacists, verify that this is a quality product, it is what it says it is, it's labeled appropriately, it's being dosed appropriately, and so on. We got fed up. We took a step back and we said, okay, we're gonna ask these companies to at least meet a labeling standard. They have to send us something called a certificate of analysis, which means they've had their product analyzed by an independent party that says that what's on the label is what's in the bottle. 90% of the companies never responded. And of the 10% that responded, of the that 10%, often they would send us certificates of analysis where what was on the label wasn't even close to what was in the bottle. And these were the ones who responded to us, which made us fearful of an industry that we couldn't trust. For example, this is an aqueous vitamin D drop. So we use vitamin D in um, premature infants. It says it should have 400 international units per one ml of solution. However, it tells us that their results are that it's 213% of the labeled value. So it's more than double what it says that it is. So if we're dosing premature infants who need very tiny doses of this drug, we're now potentially giving them double what they should get and could really put them at risk for toxicity. I want to turn to uh, Joanne Manson first. Um, what role does the medical profession have where supplements are concerned? Well, I think there should be a much larger role than currently. Many clinicians and medical students receive very little training in this area. And so it is not a routine part of the medical curriculum or the residency training. And many clinicians are not asking patients about what supplements they're taking, and they're not giving their patients any advice about, for example, avoiding certain supplements that may interact with medications, or once they understand what supplements they're taking, recommending that they uh, do something differently if they're going to be having surgery in the near future, etc. So I think it needs to, more attention is necessary to uh, clinician medical school training in this area and um, also more education encouragement of the public to talk with clinicians, talk with their doctors and their um, healthcare providers about the supplements that they're taking, asking them if they could be interacting with medications that they're on and also being familiar with some of the very reliable websites um, and sources of information about these supplements. You know, the Office of Dietary Supplements is, is a very good um, website to get information about supplements, and there are other national uh, websites. But the, the conversation between the clinician and the patient on dietary supplements is extremely limited. Chuck Bell, I want to turn to you. Uh, what's happening on the political front in terms of legislation at the federal or state or even local level? Uh, so what we've noticed at Consumer Reports is that we have some unsafe herbal ingredient, ingredients that we've called out in magazine articles that we publish every couple of years, and many of them have remained on the marketplace uh, for a very long time. So for example, we published an article in 2004 uh, warning about Yohimbi and Chaparral, Lobelia. Uh, and what are those? Uh, these are herbal supplements mm -hmm. that have um, a variety of s side effects, and we recommend that consumers don't use them. Uh, one of the one other ones we warned out about at that 
time uh, was Ephedra. And so with the exception of Ephedra, the other ones I'm mentioning are still on the marketplace today. So uh, uh, an important takeaway is unsafe ingredients can remain on the marketplace for a very long time. With the case of Ephedra, this is a, a stimulant that was linked to um, strokes and heart attacks, uh, linked to several deaths, deaths of professional athletes and, and young athletes. And uh, there were tens of thousands of adverse event uh, reports about this product uh, about going back 10, 15 years. And it fell to the states, actually, to uh, uh, ban the product. It was first banned in New York, Illinois, and California before the FDA was able to take action on it. And the reason is, in the D Dietary uh, Supplement Health and Education Act, there's a very high standard of proof for the FDA to re uh, remove products from the marketplace. And they haven't used the authority that they have very often. So the concern we have, too, is with the size of the marketplace, FDA's resources really haven't been able to keep up. They have um, roughly a budget of five million and uh, two dozen people to police a marketplace with 90,000 products. It's you know ten times larger than it was in 1994. So there's a real concern about safety that the government is not able to act in a prompt and effective way to get dangerous products out of the marketplace. But the instances you mentioned where uh, suddenly certain products are banned in certain states or localities, what does then the company do? What what obligations are they under? Do they just well, we're not selling there anymore, or is there any penalties yeah, or things so, they're forced to do? Yeah, so, so I mean, it's very unusual, actually, for states to take action on something like that. In this case, it was particularly egregious, and it was very clear that FDA would not act. Now the FDA has pulled the FEDRA back and is not allowed to be sold. So companies have responded, but, but they're responding by going to introduce similar uh, ingredients that also have stimulant effects for weight loss uh, mm -hmm. products. And, and Peter might want to say more about this, but they haven't given up. They're trying to innovate and come forward with other ingredients that are legal, but nevertheless may be risky for consumers. Peter, you want to add something? Um, right. Uh, after the after ephedra was banned, that's when we really saw this explosion of creative stimulants that are really synthetically, pharmaceutically created tweaks. Um, and those stimulants have found their way into the weight loss products, but also into many sports uh, sports supplements. So my advice to consumers about the sports supplements is avoid, or actually this is across the board really, um, to avoid supplements that contain something called a proprietary blend. So a proprietary blend allows the, the um, company to put in ingredients <coughs> without uh, telling us about the amount. And in those, um, uh, products, and you can take a look at the back to see if there's a proprietary blend, those tend to be the higher risk uh, products. So um, uh, yeah, th that would be one, one tip I would share with uh, consumers. Bryn, I want to mention, I want to go to you. Uh, we're talking legislation, and I know you're, you're involved at the state level. Uh, what's going on at, at the state level? I know your, your focus is on youth, particularly around uh, weight loss drugs and um, and where that intersects with eating disorders. Uh, what's happening? Sure, there? yeah, and as Chuck said, it, it was really incumbent on states to take action first around ephedra. It certainly wasn't sudden. It was, a, it was a lot of work by many people to get states to move many years ago, and then finally motivated the FDA to move on ephedra. And the same, we're in the same situation now. Our group uh, uh, did a legal study a few years ago led by Jennifer Pomerantz, a colleague of mine, a health law specialist at New York University, where we laid out basically the roadmap for what states and cities can do to act on this to protect consumers, to protect their residents, and especially from our perspective, to. Uh, protect children and adolescents. And there's actually a lot that states and cities can do. We don't need to wait for the FDA. We don't need for Congress. We don't need to wait for Congress. We certainly want them to step in, but it probably isn't happening soon. But today, tomorrow, state legislatures can introduce uh, bills to regulate these products. And that's where we have an example in Massachusetts. Uh, my program, Striped, is working with a, a community partner, the Multi-Service Eating Disorders Association, led by Beth Mayer and Representative Kay Kahn in the Massachusetts State House. And Representative Kahn introduced a bill in this legislative session to ban the sale of dietary supplements sold for weight loss or muscle building to minors, so anyone under 18, and to move those products behind the counter so that they are not, uh, any consumer coming through the store is not inundated with a visual field filled with marketing marketing about how they should use these products. We don't want that kind of marketing happening out there. It's misleading consumers, it's exploiting people with weight concerns, and exploiting youth. 
Uh, so the, the bill, if it were passed into law, would move the products behind the counter and also have the Department of Public Health have warning signs. Cities can do the same thing. Cities actually have the power to act now also. City councils can do that. Health departments can do this. Um, one by one, we can start, just like was done with ephedra and actually has been done with tobacco, cities and states can one by one start to get this taken care of, of protecting consumers and youth. Um, and then eventually we would expect the federal government will follow as it typically does with uh, public health causes like this. Joanne, I want to turn to you um, about labeling. Um, how, how effective is labeling uh, and does it work? Or where are we with that in terms of warning consumers? Well, there are very few labels on these supplements, and most of them will say something that the claim, the statement has not been evaluated by the FDA, but I think that we need to educate consumers to actually read those labels and to understand what that means. And even in the case of the vitamins and minerals, you know, mega doses of vitamins and minerals, uh, it will, there will be some promotes heart health or whatever, but the statement has not been evaluated by the FDA. I don't think in general that's looked at very closely by consumers or that's really understood that it means there aren't studies, there aren't research studies, large-scale randomized trials to evaluate efficacy or safety. So it's truly buyer beware um, in terms of taking really any of, of these supplements. There, um, many of them are just the uh, recommended dietary allowance dose and we would not I expect them to have a substantial risk. But when you're taking mega doses for long periods periods of time, even vitamins and minerals can be uh, found to have risk. I, I think we need, in addition to the regulation, better education and information for consumers about how to read the labels and what the labels actually mean and how there's really very little, if any, in many cases, evidence for efficacy or safety. And also, again, coming back to clinicians, because I think this is so important, that this should be routinely assessed. Um, we should be knowing, clinicians should know uh, which supplements patients are taking uh, so that they can understand whether there might be interactions with medications that the patient is prescribed or problems in terms of the patient's medical conditions that maybe they should not be taking those supplements. So I, I think that this really has to get out more to uh, both consumers and clinicians. Bill? Yeah, w one issue to be aware of is that um, many supplements are taken uh, by older Americans who are also <laughs> heavy users in many cases of prescription drugs. And so sometimes supplements may interact with uh, prescription drugs in unexpected ways, either increasing the potency of the drug or lowering it. Um, and in other cases, there are supplements like ginkgo that interfere with uh, blood clotting. So if you're going in for surgery, you should discuss the use of a supplement like that yeah. with your surgeon. And so we think it would be helpful to have better labeling to warn consumers about the potentials for herb-drug interactions. Uh, and by and large, this is something people are not very aware of. And in looking at the supplements we have today, we have example them, examined them and found labeling to be quite inconsistent across different products. So for example, there's a supplement 5-HTP that may interact with antidepressants, and yet you don't necessarily see that warning on every product that has 5-HTP in it. I think what's interesting to me is that um, before I you know, learned about this by preparing for this panel, I would never have known that there were these issues out there. And so, and I'm a fairly informed person. And so, and, and you see this stuff everywhere, from tons of stores and every type of store. So why is there such a disconnect between what people encounter out there and, are now, and believe? You know, I thought taking, you know, multivitamins and, and, you know, vitamin D and all these things, that they're good, that they're, they're helpful. Why such a huge disconnect between what you're concerned with and what I think the popular conception is about these. Uh, do you want to start, Chuck? Yeah, I, I think one thing is that there is a cultural predisposition to want to do things to improve your own health. And, you know, a lot of aspects of healthcare, our healthcare system are very expensive and supplements are relatively affordable. And so I think that there's a, a, an interest in self-medication, actually, that 
really doesn't line up with the facts we have. Uh, consumers would be better off to vi avoid most use of supplements. I mean, if we had our way on this panel, probably this industry would not be 37 billion. It might be, you know, um, one, one or two billion. It would be much, much smaller. And so if consumers look at the actual evidence base to support the use of dietary supplements, they would use these products much less. And so th that's why we re really recommend that you only uh, take a supplement after consultation with your doctor or health provider if they've specifically recommended it, but in most cases they're not going to. They're going to say you're going to be able to get the vitamins you need by picking up an orange or a carrot. And, Bryn. And, I, and I would add, we, we really need to also focus on the retailers. They are exacerbating exactly that need on the part of consumers. People <coughs> want to take control of their health, feel like they're doing something. Retailers know that. The, the chief medical officers, the chief pharmacists of every pharmacy, of every grocery chain, of these gyms, they know what we know. That all this research is public information. The website from the FDA with all the warnings, the Department of Defense warning website, uh, OS, uh, the, the Operation Supplement Safety P, uh, Program, OSSP. It's public, anyone can look it up. It's one of the best websites for information about supplements. They know this at all these retailers and yet they stock their shelves with these products. They put the marketing out there that is deceiving the public thinking that they're doing something about their health or it's going to lead to weight loss or it's going to lead to muscle gain and they're profiting from it. I think that there's really a role for corporate social responsibility in this too. We're not going to legislate our way out of this. The FDA is not going to protect us anytime soon on the level that we need because their hands are tied by Congress. Uh, what we need is for corporations to step up and take responsibility for the products on their shelves. If we know that these products are unsafe, they know that they shouldn't be having them on their shelves. What moves corporations is uh, if we can achieve a change in the economic pressures on them and the ethical pressures on them. And that's what consumer advocacy is very good for, what clinicians speaking up is, is so important for. If we change the balance of the economic environment and the ethical environment that these corporations are working in, they're going to make some different choices about which products they have on their shelves and what they're willing to sell to their consumers and sell to children. <coughs> Joanne, I think you had something to say. Yes, I, I still think that having programs like the, the Frontline um, program, I heard from so many patients and you know clinicians after that program aired, uh, saying things like, I had no idea. Why wasn't I hearing about all these problems with supplements? So I think that um, the media has a potentially very great role to play in increasing awareness of these problems. And I think people will listen. And I think it will be very educational to uh, and consumers to the public and to clinicians who probably will get most of their information about this topic uh, from the media. But um, again, I, I think that clinicians really can, uh, and it doesn't have to be just the very, very busy um, physician in clinical practice. It can be the healthcare team who is involved with this. So for example, when the patient is first coming in and getting you know, their blood pressure checked and all that, there could be information obtained about what supplements are. What are you taking over the counter? This is just very much neglected in the uh, clinician patient encounter. What are you taking over the counter? As Chuck mentioned, you know, there are a lot of serious uh, potential interactions with medications. Also, if a patient is going to have surgery, it's important that they may not be taking something like ginkgo that can, you know, right before the surgery that can increase um, the risk of bleeding. But I also want to say that it's important for the clinician to talk to the patient about some supplements that they may want to take, which is the other, you know, the opposite side of the coin. So for example, if they are taking certain medications, they may need extra um, magnesium or B12 or vitamin D or calcium. You know, if they have certain health conditions, the clinician, it, it will be very helpful if the clinician is knowledgeable about what supplements a patient should take to improve their health because a medication could interfere with absorption or bioavailability. So it's really both sides of the coin. Peter? Yeah, I, I might have a slightly different opinion than some of the, my colleagues up here in terms of access. So to me, I think that selling of botanical supplements, although I don't recommend them to my patients, is completely, uh, um, I'm completely for them being available in the store. I don't see any reason why if you're selling ice cream, 
um, and other unhealthy uh, food products, you can't sell ginkgo biloba or um, echinacea. I, I, I see no problem with that. The problem comes into um, uh, labeling and advertising. And the pro uh, so to begin with is just to re-emphasize the structure function claim and what that really means. The structure function claim means that you can impress or, or, or imply to the consumer that this will improve your health. That's where you have a big problem. And it's also a big problem because it's one thing to put up a, a sign in front of the broccoli and say, you know, this is great for heart health. And what's different about it is that when we go to buy food, we're using not only thousands of years of evolution, but all our senses to know if the food's spoiled. So we look at the broccoli, does it look like it's rotting? We smell it and we can taste it. With supplements, these are pills that are being swallowed that we can't use any of our senses for. So the only information we have, or consumers have, is that marketing, what's on the, on the label. So to me, there's two fundamental issues. One is this eliminating or greatly curtailing the structure function claims that are being made. The second thing, though, is if, you're gonna, if you want to go and buy echinacea because you think it'll work for colds, and I also, the science is that it doesn't. But that's okay if you still want to buy it for colds, in my opinion, if the product's safe. So the issue is, is it safe? And if you're buying echinacea in the store, is it what it has on the label? Um, and when people buy echinacea, they're thinking, okay, I'm using a, something that's been used in traditional Chinese medicine, let's say, for hundreds of years. But in reality, because of the manufacturing uh, issues in, and how supplements are sold in the United States, the, how a traditional echinacea preparation and what you buy in the store is just like night and day. They're, they're not, they don't overlap. So to me, I think that if we were to have a, a thoughtful regulatory framework that when you bought echinacea, it actually contained a particular preparation of echinacea, and it wasn't, it wasn't uh, misrepresented as, as doing magical things, that it doesn't, uh, because even after there's good randomized controlled trials saying echinacea doesn't help with colds. Today, it's completely legal to sell your echinacea as if it's an immune booster. So this is where the, uh, for me, this is where the, the problem is. How, oh, go ahead, Brian. I just wanted to, um, to follow up in, in hearing the both of you. Uh, it's reminded me that another, uh, another side of this also is that when people are choosing these dietary supplements, say for weight loss, um, it's diverting it, money and attention to more healthful things they could be doing. And that's something we're cons especially concerned about uh, populations that um, uh, are already maybe living with lower resources. So we know that among people trying to, to lose weight, African Americans and Latinos are more likely to use these dietary supplements for weight loss than our white populations. We know that uh, households living with much lower incomes are more likely to use these products. Um, and uh, households where there's less education are more likely to use these products. And it's probably because at, at a one-off purchase of the store each week, it's more affordable than paying for a whole program or maybe it's not feasible to make some of the other changes. But for all the public health recommendations about healthy nutrition and physical activity, if people are being shuttled through this intense marketing that Peter mentions toward these other options that one, don't work, two, could be dangerous, and three, are wasting their money, then that's a really serious public health problem that we need to be grappling with, how to protect people. And as I keep coming back to, especially our young people, especially the children, young people are going to be even less able to, to see the difference with the marketing pitches. They really, marketing's very powerful, can affect anyone of anyone's any age, but a 12-year-old coming in and seeing that kind of marketing, we're really worried about that, or, or folks with less education being particularly exploited by these industries and the weight loss one in particular. Uh, one other aspect I'd like to bring out is that there are issues with quality assurance in the manufacturing of supplements. Um, there are good manufacturing practices that supplement makers are supposed to follow, but we have today a global supply chain where many ingredients are imported, and some issues have popped up with supplements uh, including contaminants like heavy metals such as lead and cadmium. And there have been studies that show that uh, middle-aged women who took supplements had a 10% higher level of lead in their blood. 
And so the levels aren't necessarily off the charts in terms of a safety issue from that particular product, but no issue of, uh, no additional increment of lead or cadmium is particularly helpful from a health uh, standpoint. And yet, you know, we're seeking out these products because we think they will improve health, and it's not hel helpful to have contaminants in there. And the FDA's access to overseas manufacturing plants is, is limited in many cases. Uh, and their budget to go and inspect those uh, facilities is also very limited, so they only get to a very, a very small fraction of the manufacturing plants for supplements. So this is something consumers may not be aware of, but uh, you know, in the clip about the hospital, you know, obviously if you're serving or including supplements in a hospital, you want to make sure that they're not making people sick, and so yet it's not very easy to f run all that down and to make sure that that's the case. We're going to go to Q&A with one quick comment, and we'll go to Q&A. Yeah, I, I just want to ask the other panelists a question, because I get asked very often about whether it really helps to see on the label um, that it's, you know, the good manufacturing practices seal or the U.S. <laughs> pharmacopoeia um, verification seal. Is that something that we should be recommending that people look for? What do you think about that um, information on the label? I, I think we've said that it's generally better than not having it, but mm -hmm. it's not necessarily a, supp uh, a supplement for having the eff effective oversight of the federal government. Right. Because a private label certification program, they don't necessarily have the authority to go in and inspect facilities. and. Um, so, so, but they, they, those, uh, I think there, there's, some, there's some <laughs> utility to it, yes. But, but one of the challenges there, though, is that if you grab a supplement bottle, it'll have stamps all over it. So, you know, a, a, a consumer, your average consumer, will have absolutely no idea which of these stamps are legitimate. Everyone has like a third party like yeah. stamp on their bottle. So we do have to let consumers know about that some of those stamps are more powerful, like USP, NSF International, I do do research with NSF, but um, some of these are much higher quality you know, um, processes than others. But that you cannot, an uh, average consumer cannot tell the difference when and it's And I think average level. consumers don't know to even look at labels right. and look for <laughs> Maybe educate the public yeah, more yes. about looking for certain labels. And We're going to go to Q&A now. Some of these topics may come up in the questions. Uh, Lisa Marowitz is going to give us her first question. Yes, thanks, Carol. And you're covering material that's in a lot of these questions, which is great. We have a lot of questions. Um, this is from a viewer in Pakistan uh, asking about the role of flaxseed in lowering blood pressure blood pressure, stabilizing blood sugar levels, and enhancing male sex drive, and the role of chia seed in improving female complexion, building stamina, and strong bones and muscles. Joanne, is that a question for you? Well, a lot of questions. Off. Very <laughs> little research um, on any of those, you know, questions. Um, in terms of, of flaxseed, there's a lot of interest in alpha linolenic acid and the plant-based omega-3s. A lot of research, as you know, on the fish-based marine omega-3s, but many people are vegetarians or would prefer to use the plant-based ALA. And it's surprising, because I have actually reviewed that literature pretty extensively, and uh, there are no really large-scale randomized trials looking at clinical endpoints in, in detail. Um, so I think the research is limited, but some of the trials, the smaller trials, have shown some benefits in terms of the cardiovascular risk factors, but has not been totally consistent. And the chia, does anyone else want to comment on that? <laughs> no. But, but, <laughs> but what Joanne said is true for so many things, that there's, yeah. a, there's a small study that suggests either epidemiological association or um, a small study involving 20 patients who received something and then purportedly some little factor change in them. And then that is what's completely legitimate because of the laws to be promoted as if that has that ability in humans. That, that, that's where we're at. And then more often than not, or maybe 90 nine percent of the time when the large randomized controlled trials are performed it turns out not to uh, have the effect that was seen in the small trials and there's also very often no distinction made between the small observational study where the, the, the literature can be selectively reviewed as Peter mentioned and those large-scale randomized trials which may get very different results 
Great, thank you. Um, here's another one. Would you please ask the panelists what their knowledge is of national registries or a national database that tracks hospitalizations that might be related to supplementation? Sounds like there have been several studies done, but no aggregated national data? Um, right. So there is, th that's a great, um, very important point we haven't really focused on. So it's true that we've talked about how these products are being sold as if they're all safe. But then we also know from the CDC research that there's tens of thousands of emergency department visits, thousands of hospitalizations due to these products. So the next question is, how does the FDA identify which of those products are the most dangerous and remove those from store shelves? And the thinking was, the law was like, just take care of that, but without funding or a system to um, to detect harm from supplements. So there's a huge gap. The CDC study was just a one-off time when they were looking at the Sentinel sites for a few years to look at harm. There's no ongoing effective system that detects harm from supplements. So what generally, ha what sometimes happens is that oftentimes, there, there's so many gaps, but one big gap is that providers often don't ask patients or the patients don't share with them that they've used the supplement. So even if they have liver failure, they might be um, shy about sharing the fact that they were taking a weight loss supplement for the last month because they kind of knew that was slightly, you know, may maybe someone else had told them not to do it. Now they're embarrassed to talk. The doctors aren't asking them. But even when doctors ask and say, oh, I think that this person is um, in, has hepatitis due to the supplement they were taking, Many doctors don't know where to report that, and uh, sometimes we might call the poison control centers if we're worried about, especially uh, someone taking extra of something like your child's gotten to your multivitamins. But what's interesting is while the poison control centers are getting thousands of calls about supplements every year, they don't, there's no commu zero communication with the FDA. So those cases are not shared with the FDA. The FDA works on just uh, providers or consumers filling out these paper, this paperwork for MedWatch saying, I took the supplement and I got sick. So this passive surveillance system that we know is not useful uh, to, um, to track a real harm in real time. So uh, we, we basically don't have a system to detect the most dangerous supplements. Therefore, the FDA could not possibly be removing the dangerous supplements in, a, in any, maybe at all, but certainly not uh, in a timely fashion. Yeah. Well, I was just going to comment that in uh, 2007, federal law was actually amended, one of the few times on dietary supplements, and it was to require that manufacturers who receive adverse event reports where a consumer had to be seen uh, by a, a physician or in a hospital, uh, that if a supplement manufacturer receives that type of report, they have to forward it to the FDA MedWatch system. So we strengthen adverse event reporting, and over a recent uh, three-year period, there are about 6,300 adverse events uh, reports, including 1,000 serious uh, incidents and injuries and uh, 94 deaths linked to use of supplements. But it's widely believed that they, these incidents are underreported because people don't know who to call. So call the FDA if you have a problem with the supplement. Well, that, that was another question. What are the steps individuals can follow to issue a complaint about a particular dietary supplement or describe its side effects? So. Any other thoughts? Uh, yeah, so you can report them to FDA uh, MedWatch, or you can call a poison control center, and they will take the uh, complaint. And it's good for both consumers and their physicians to use yeah. these systems. The physicians will of often have more detailed information. But I thought poison control then doesn't communicate with somebody else, so uh, but the, not. Right, right. So it would be good to ideally report okay. to, to both. But this is the supplement safety system we have, which we call post-marketing surveillance. We watch what happens with the products after they're in the marketplace, and in a sense, uh, consumers Consumers are being used as test animals to see how the products work out, and it's it's not a good system. We well, I would say <laughs> that we're, we're here, here it's it, it's not watching. Yeah, and it's just putting it into the marketplace. Yeah, and not see what watching. happens. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, why don't we see if anyone in the audience has a question? Thanks so much for this great panel. For the new parents out there whose pediatricians would, for example, recommend iron supplements for their children. Are children are supplements for children special in the sense that is there is there better quality control to make sure that the stated ingredients and concentrations are actually what's on the label, or is is are every is everything you're talking about also applicable to 
uh, supplements marketed specifically for children. Pretty much the same. It, it's essentially the same. So there's no there's <laughs> no higher problems. standard. No. What do parents do um, when they're given a prescription for a supplement? What would you recommend? Uh, well, sometimes it can be a prescription that's given. So sometimes the clinician first checking with the clinician. Um, before with a very young child um, to see if a certain supplement is needed and if it's uh, if it is recommended then sometimes it's given as a prescription where there is the FDA oversight in terms of purity and consistency of dose but it's <laughs> it can be the same problems if it's something this over is our the pediatrician counter. who suggested it so right, it's right, a clinician right. who's suggesting it right so. uh, again sometimes the vitamin D it can be given as a prescription um, medication if it's um, over-the-counter there's potentially that concern and I mean this really is where you would well. maybe look at something like these seal programs like um, uh, USP right, US Pharmacopeia or, yeah. NSF International Consumer Lab would give some additional assurance of the quality but um, it's, it's not necessarily everything we would want and unfortunately, as Joanne has mentioned before, physicians aren't getting this training or other he kinds of health care providers, with the exception of maybe nutritionists, uh, they're not getting this training. But I do want to give a shout out to the American Academy of Pediatrics, which recently came out with a new online training, short brief training, for uh, uh, provider, health care providers who work with adolescents, so a little older than the question about infants, uh, and how to talk to them about uh, supplements, so how to talk to teens about supplements, how to ask the questions that everyone on the panel has, has mentioned clinicians aren't asking, they don't know how to ask, they're not sure what to be looking for. The American Academy of Pediatrics now has this training online, it's free, um, any clinician can log in there and uh, learn more, we develop more skills on how to talk to teens about these products. One more question? Okay, I think we'll do one more. We have a lot here. So we've had a lot of questions about vitamin D and calcium. So I just want to take one. Is it safe to say that in light of the latest research, if you are otherwise healthy and eat well, including fortified foods, you are probably receiving enough sunshine to have adequate vitamin D levels and don't need to take supplements? Well, there are several professional organizations that have provided guidelines for vitamin D and calcium and there is a certain amount <laughs> recommended, which is moderate dose intake. And most of these organizations have not specifically recommended supplements. They have recommended <laughs> trying to have intake through diet. And good news is the new nutrition labels, will, uh, when they're available, they will have vitamin D content. It will be easier to tell the vitamin D content of foods, but it's usually fortified dairy products or fish, or, uh, foods like that. And calcium, um, very often you can get enough from your diet unless you have lactose intolerance or really avoid calcium, really avoid the dairy products, in which case you may need a supplement at least to fill the gap. But the current recommendations are unless you have a bone health problem, um, or a clear need such as you have malabsorption or celiac disease or gastric, had gastric bypass surgery or some condition where your absorption of, and metabolism of vitamin D will be different. Um, there isn't a strong recommendation to take supplements. But that said, I don't think there's a problem with taking a low to moderate dose supplement of either calcium or vitamin D. It's really with the mega doses and getting above what the Institute of Medicine, now the National Academy of Medicine, calls the tolerable upper intake level. So there are many there, there are many um, uh, researchers out there telling everyone to take 5,000 to 10,000 IUs a day of vitamin D. And that is above what the National Academy of Medicine considers tolerable upper intake. And there's really no evidence for long-term uh, benefit or safety of taking such high doses, such high amounts of vitamin D. Joanne, is there any benefit of getting your calcium from food rather than supplements? Yes. I, I do think that there's increasing evidence that there's an advantage of having uh, calcium from foods rather than supplements, and supplements should be used just to fill the gap. And this relates to uh, kidney stones, that the calcium will bind the oxalate in foods, and calcium calcium oxalate stones are the most common form of kidney stones. And also for heart disease, there have been a few studies, though I think it's um, somewhat uh, limited and selective, that have suggested increased risk of heart attack, cardiovascular events with uh, supplemental calcium, but not with dietary calcium. Overall, 
dietary calcium from foods has, if anything, been linked to a lower risk of cardiovascular events. Some concerns have been raised about the supplements. I don't think it's conclusive, but given the kidney stones evidence, try to get from uh, the, these nutrients from foods, if at all possible. Thank well, you. Well, we're coming to the end of our hour, uh, but we don't want our panelists to leave without leaving a, a policy recommendation. Um, the the uh, forum will put together a clip and send these to influencers and policymakers. Let's start with Peter. Peter, policy recommendation for a takeaway. Um, sure. Uh, what, just one? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I guess I, I would argue for four things. W one thing is that I would like to see um, an effective system created to detect um, dangerous supplements. Um, Labeling-wise, I would eliminate structure function claims that, especially in the high-risk categories like weight loss and, and sports supplements. And I would also require some basics like herb-drug interactions or vitamin-drug interactions, as well as known side effects to be on the label so that consumers can accurately see what they're purchasing. Bryn. Think globally, act locally. City attorneys, city councils, constituents, we may be consumers on the one end, but all of us who are consumers are also constituents, and we can be advocates, which is what Chuck's work is all about. Ask your city councils, talk to your city attorney, say, why don't you do something about this? We don't want our neighbors, our children, to be exposed to these products when they're so poorly regulated. Same at the state level. State attorney generals, uh, legislatures, like as, as uh, Representative Kay Kahn right here in Massachusetts is showing you, they can take leadership, constituents can demand that of our leaders to step up, and the corporations. They know all this, this is no secret. Everyone who runs every pharmacy, every grocery store, they know the same research that we know, they can take more responsibility when consumers demand it, change the balance of the economic pressures through your wallet and the ethical pressures through what you expect from them, we can get them to move. Joanne. I, I agree with all these um, recommendations. I, I would like to further emphasize the importance of have make, increasing the awareness um, among consumers of the lack of testing, safety, and efficacy of even vitamin mineral high dose, um, vitamin mineral supplements, and getting the healthcare system and healthcare teams more involved in collecting the information about what supplements are being taken and uh, providing um, advice to patients about what to avoid given medications that they're taking. Uh, so for us, uh, I think it's very important for consumers to protect themselves in the breach of federal action uh, by reaching for the apple or the orange or the carrot. And I would like to say Congress is on the threshold of taking action to improve oversight, but actually um, progress has been glacial, and it's because of the enormous influence of the dietary supplement industry, now 37 billion strong, uh, it is compromising consumer health and safety. And so my biggest wish would be for uh, more resources to be given to the FDA and the Federal Trade Commission to do their jobs. And if we have 20 times more supplements in the marketplace, we have to increase their budgets by like 10x or 20x so that they would have a fighting chance of being able to protect consumers. We've had over a thousand products contaminated with prescription drugs for weight loss or Viag herbal, vi uh, herbal Viagra products contaminated with Viagra that have been withdrawn uh, by FDA, but it's scary that so many dangerous products are coming to the marketplace and the response is way too slow. So uh, that would be my wish is dr drain the swamp, uh, ignore the industry <laughs> influence, and, and, and let's, pass some, let's pass some laws to protect consumers. I want to thank the panel for being with us today. It was incredibly informative. And I want to encourage viewers to continue the conversation and ask more questions at the forum website, forumhsph.org. And tune in to our next forum, which is Gene Editing, Promises and Challenges. Thank you very much. If you are interested in supporting this program and others like this from the Leadership Studio at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, please call 617-432-1318 for further information.